Olweli Mzanz Africa ikamala mdingu siviwe kwa khube. Welcome to the inside track. The alcohol ban. South Africa's dry January continues and it has far-reaching consequences beyond being just an inconvenience to you and I. Today, we take a look at the far-reaching devastation that has resulted from the alcohol ban, from the hundreds of thousands of jobs that have been lost to the impact unemployment has had on families. We ask the question, has the ban really been worth it? Did the health system benefit from it? Can businesses ever recover the jobs that have been lost? We also have Helen Zilla, the DA's Federal Council Chair, to unpack the DA's legal action to compel government to provide a detailed vaccination, acquisition and distribution plan. And we hear first from a South African who has already received the vaccine in a clinical trial. But first up, let's take a look back at the week in headlines. The state security agency was used as a political weapon, that's the word from former chairperson of a review panel into the agency, Sidney Mufamadi. In order to influence the outcome of cases against uh, President Zuma. Mpumalanga Premier Refilo Mtsweni Tsipane was seen without a mask at the funeral of uh, the late minister in the presidency, Jackson Mtemblu. The Liquor Traders Association of South Africa is pleading with government to lift some of the restrictions on alcohol purchases. Reports of alleged PPE tender irregularities are emerging at the Gauteng Health Department. South African citizens are facing probably the biggest uh, health crisis uh, in democratic South Africa after the HIV AIDS pandemic and need to have full information around what government's doing, when it's going to happen, where we're getting it from and what it's going to cost. And those details are shrouded in absolute secrecy. This week in the headlines, the DA is demanding the full details of government's vague vaccine rollout plan. And we see an astonishing double standard applied to government leaders who fail to wear masks. And Sasa admits that it does not have money to extend disability grants to our most vulnerable citizens. And this week, we bid farewell to Minister Jackson Mtembo. This week, while ordinary, hard-working South Africans continued to suffer under the world's longest and hardest lockdown, it was revealed that the Gauteng Premier, David Makura, allegedly instructed the appointment of certain companies to provide PPE in the province. It is clear that money that was meant for COVID relief ended up in the pockets of the ANC's politically connected. That is why we've called for the Premier Makura to take leave pending the investigation into this PPE scandal that he's now at the center of. And meanwhile, it is very heartening to learn that the Western Cape has passed its second wave peak. The DA fully supports Premier Alan Wendy's call that in light of this, the Western Cape economy must start to be opened safely. The curfew should be relaxed, beaches should open up, and the alcohol ban should be lifted. In the continued mess that is the UIF, it has emerged that they will not be extending the temporary employer-employee relief scheme. This means that tens of thousands of workers who are unable to earn their full income or in some cases any income at all because of the continued lockdown restrictions will no longer be able to receive any assistance from government. This is truly astonishing because we know that there is still UIF money in the pots. And these funds don't belong to government, but they belong to the employers and the employees who have contributed to them. Why then has the UIF decided not to extend its tour scheme? There's absolutely no transparency forthcoming from government on this. And that is why the UIF must come and explain its decision in Parliament. This week, we also called on Lindy Wezulu to extend the 350 Rand COVID grant. This too is set to come to an end at the end of this month. One cannot help but wonder, has our government now completely abandoned our most vulnerable South Africans? This situation is deeply ironic given that the ANC government is always purporting 
to be portraying itself to be pro-poor. But when it comes down to it, they simply aren't. Preferring instead to spend money on vanity pro projects like bailing out SAA to the tune of 26 billion rand. On Sunday, the Mpumalanga Premier was spotted in the funeral service of Minister Jackson Mtembo without a mask. If you think that that is no big deal, a shocking video was released last week of the police in Worcester assaulting a man with a shambok because he was not wearing a mask. A shambok. It is clear that there's one set of rules for ANC politicians and another set of rules for ordinary South Africans. If you don't wear a mask, you get beaten up by the police and have a criminal record to boot. ANC politicians don't wear a mask and they get away with it virtually scot-free with absolutely inexplicable excuses. Brutality by law enforcement agency in the time of COVID-19 is nothing new. Last year, we saw the shocking incident where Mr. Collins Causa lost his life after he was brutally killed by soldiers and the police. We have also seen hundreds of thousands of ordinary citizens being arrested and fined for contravening irrational lockdown regulations, including that father who was arrested for buying formula after curfew for his one-day-old baby. Yet we saw the Mpumalanga Premier Refile and Tsweni Tsipane embracing people mask-free at the funeral of a colleague that we had just lost to COVID and with little to no consequences. On Monday at the Zondo Commission, it was revealed that Jacob Zuma has been siphoning illegal payments of over 4 million rand a month from state coffers via the State Security Agency. It was also revealed that he was involved in special operations to influence the media, to bribe judges to find cases in his favor. And more absurdly, toxicologists were routinely hired to test Jacob Zuma's bedding and food. We have always prided ourselves on having strong institutions in South Africa. But this unravels just how deep and reveals just how deep that state capture rot has become. Is there any institution left that has escaped any contamination at all from the Zuma years? And this brings me to our main headline today, the government's rollout of COVID-19 vaccine. Today, the DA is launching its court application to compel government to provide a vaccine acquisition and rollout plan. The DA has repeatedly called on government to be transparent about the handling of this crisis and its vaccine plan. And we have put forward credible, workable solutions in order to save lives. However, government is hell-bent on operating under a veil of secrecy and vagueness in response to the biggest crisis facing South Africa to date. Right now, there are many more questions than there are answers when it comes to this supposed plan. What are the details of negotiations with suppliers? Are provinces fully ready to roll out the vaccine when it eventually arrives? How are the complex logistics around storage, distribution, and allocation of the vaccine going to be handled? We are seeking an order from the court to acquire this plan so that we can hold government to account, as is our constitutional obligation. South Africans deserve to know, and South Africans deserve a credible plan that will ensure that we save lives. Finally, a study by economists Mike Shasler and Pumlani Majosi has released this week and revealed that the current level three restrictions will cost one in 12 South Africans their jobs. According to them, 1.5 million further of either formal or informal jobs are at risk in the South African economy. At least seven sectors will be hit the hardest, including travel, tourism, entertainment and leisure. These findings are corroborated by data that was released by the Western Cape government this week that shows that the Western Cape has experienced a staggering 60% decline in visitors over the peak of the festive season. Once again, the government has a moral duty to stop this job's bloodbath and open the economy as safely as possible. And moving on to our spotlight this week, the alcohol ban appears to be indefinitely ongoing. 
we take a look at the true cost of this controversial lockdown regulation. Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. South African liquor traders say the industry cannot survive another ban on alcohol sales. Thousands of people have lost their jobs as a result of the ban on alcohol sales. The sector says the development will have a devastating impact that could potentially lead to job losses right across the value chain. The South African wine industry will soon be bleeding jobs. While it understands urgent intervention is needed to take pressure off the healthcare system, it cannot be done at the expense of people's livelihoods. Around 300,000 people are employed in the value chain of the wine industry. It contributes nearly 50 billion rand to the economy. The reality is that so many of our producers are small businesses that rely very heavily on those Celador sales. Agri Western Cape says it's concerned over the possibility of further job losses and what might happen if the current harvest remains in wine cellars. During this pandemic, there has been a constant tension between how do we sustain health system capacity, ensuring that we keep trauma cases down, but at the same time, ensuring that we save jobs that are dependent on such industries. And so this has been this balance that we've had to strike. And often, many people have tried to create a false, a false dichotomy between the two, as though it's a choice between either lives or livelihoods. But in effect, both are just as important and a healthcare crisis is just as devastating as an unemployment and a poverty crisis. And so this is not just about being pro-economy or being pro-saving lives. This is about saving lives, whether it is in the healthcare system or whether it, you're talking about uh, employment. But let's get into this discussion and I'd like to welcome my guests uh, this morning uh, to get into this discussion talking about this. Uh, and I've got today Helen Ziller, who's the chairperson of our federal council. Welcome very much to the show, Helen. Thank you very much, Siv. It's great to be with you. Cool. And I've got uh, Dr. Ivan Mayer, who's our MEC for Agriculture. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I've got with me Dean McPherson, who's, go who's the Shadow Minister of Trade and Industry in Parliament for our National Caucus. Welcome, Dean. Thanks, sir. Great to be here and great to be with my other colleagues. And I'm joined on Zoom by Tinashe Nyamodugo, who's the founder of Commercial Wines, whom we will be having a conversation with a bit later. Dean, I want to start off with you. You've come out strongly saying that there has to be a lifting of this ban because of the devastating effects on, on unemployment and the unemployment figures. This has been also met with criticism, particularly from people who are saying that this needs to be balanced out with the issue in our health care system. Do you want to elaborate more about that? Well, I think we've reached broad consensus now across South Africa that the continuing ban is just simply uh, unsustainable and unacceptable. Uh, so far since March last year, 165,000 people have lost their jobs. It's people that don't have any money to take home to look after their families. And quite frankly, this is a self-created crisis by government because they failed to use the initial lockdown uh, that they told us uh, that they needed it for to build healthcare capacity. In fact, in many provinces, we see less health capacity now than there was uh, last year. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just not a, a tenable situation that we are telling people that they can't work in a country that has so much unemployment. Mm. Uh, we see unions uh, have come out this week uh, strongly uh, opposed uh, to the ban continuing, using very colourful language mm. uh, against their own uh, alliance partners. Mm. And so we have uh, taken a very strong stand uh, with the Western Cape government uh, and uh, as a political party to say that it's time to lift the ban, it's time to get people back to work uh, and try and rescue uh, what is left of the industry. But it yeah. cannot continue to be a whipping stick for government failures uh, and also for people to fight ideological battles within the ANC. Yeah. But now, on the other side of the coin, I mean, we've had healthcare workers coming out and saying this has been an absolute godsend in the sense that they've, been, they've seen a massive reduction in trauma cases uh, since the alcohol ban was introduced. 
And a lot of them are saying they now have more capacity to be able to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. Helen, I want to bring in you here um, on this very matter. I mean, alcohol harms is a big issue in South Africa. It's a very big issue. And it's something that a Liberal Party like the DA has to think about very, very seriously. We don't believe in the nanny state. We don't believe in banning things and stopping people from exercising freedom of choice. But we also believe that we have to limit harms, dramatic harms on a society that have a huge social cost. So, for example, my colleague Ivan will remember that in our term in government, we did our very best to find every single disabled child in the Western Cape to give that child a pathway to live a life they valued. And in one community, it came back, there was a survey that 35% of children were disabled. And I said, it can't possibly be. And we went back and looked again, and 35% had fetal alcohol syndrome in that one community. Mm -hmm. Now, what that does to schooling, especially of the children who haven't got fetal alcohol mm -hmm. syndrome and have to go at the pace of every child that does, is a very serious thing. So quite apart from this current health crisis, mm -hmm. We do have an alcohol crisis mm. in South Africa and the Western Cape. Mm. And changing behaviour is a massive challenge, mm. but it's not done by government bans and government prohibitions. Mm. But where we have done a lot of work in the Western Cape is without banning and without prohibitions, trying to ensure that policies are in place that encourage behaviour change. Mm. And we've put a lot of effort into that. Because ultimately, Helen, I mean, it, it, it can't just be a blunt tool, right? It can't be simply, you know, you ban alcohol and then simply, you know, that is how you deal with the crisis, particularly with with uh, hospitals trying to, to, to manage uh, hospital admissions. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't really go with the juxtaposition between livelihoods and lives, mm. because in the end, if you take people's livelihoods away, you take their lives away. Mm. And poverty means death and, yeah. and hunger and all yeah. of those sorts of things. So we really need to become a society where alcohol is freely available and people make responsible choices. Yeah. And it's getting to that point mm. that is a major challenge for us. Some of the policy interventions we did was to say, OK, we're going to legalise liquor outlets mm. at a certain ratio of liquor outlet per head of population. Mm. But then we're really going to take very tough action against the illegals. And for the legals, there are licences, and mm. then you have to abide by all the terms and conditions of your licence, including not serving somebody while they're under the influence of alcohol yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. And all of those kinds of policy mechanisms are open to government. Mm. But I do know that the doctors and the medical staff on New Year's Eve, and mm. I know quite a number, were sending me photos of totally empty trauma boards mm. and saying they've never seen anything like this yeah, before. Yeah. So we must acknowledge we have a serious alcohol problem in South Africa. Yeah. We don't believe in government prohibition because mm. we know what happens as a result of that. Mm. You get um, a whole lot of smokalage under the radar mm. and maybe they just haven't had time to get quite organised enough in this crisis. It's going to happen. Mm. We need to have sensible policies that protect children, that protect women and that protect society from alcohol abuse. Absolutely. Ivan, I want to bring you in here because as the MEC of Agriculture, you've obviously been on the ground. You've been talking to uh, winemakers and farmers. What is the situation on the ground? People are losing jobs in their droves. Absolutely. See, we I have been to a wine farm yesterday in the Cape Winelands. And as you know, we are the host of 98% of all the wine sellers in South Africa are based here in the Western Cape. Mm. It's significantly part of the economy of the Western Cape. Mm. And so really it breaks my heart to see what is happening on the wine farms. Mm. A wine farm has three sources of income. Firstly, through the sale of a wine mm. on the farm. The second source is there's a restaurant, there's wine tasting. Mm. And the third one is also significantly important is the issue of agro, uh, tourism, people are having accommodation on the farms, and all those three sources mm. of income is now gone. Mm. And it is devastating to see the impact it has on lives and livelihoods. Mm. Mm. I mean, the restaurant yesterday was closed. Yeah. The accommodation was closed. Sure. There were no workers there. Mm. Today starts the harvesting season on that particular farm. Mm. There's about 40,000 people working in the wine industry, mm. looking at the life loads, about 240,000. Mm. They lost already, just in this short period, one billion rand 
it yeah. has a devastating negative impact. Yeah. And this is creating another pandemic, yeah. an unemployment pandemic. Yeah. And this is a crisis this government must understand, not yeah. even to talk about issues that Dean normally raise about the loss of yeah. taxation. Yeah. Being in the middle of a pandemic, there's no money in the national fiscus. Here we are losing money through the tax on the liquor industry. I think we have agreed. There was a period when we needed to assist the healthcare workers, mm. to reduce the pressure in the trauma and the emergency. And as Alan Zeller correctly now pointed out, mm. we have seen visuals mm. of really empty uh, EC centers and trauma centers. We have agreed with the national government, let's have a two week period yeah. to relax it. That two week period is now gone. Mm. We have now evidence and the data before us that the pressures that were on the hospitals are now gone. Yeah. And so we are calling with the national government through the command center and yesterday, I have written to the National Minister Toko Dudiza mm. to ask her to immediately please ask the National Command Council to stop the ban on yeah. the liquor industry. Because as Zilla rightly pointed out, when you stop the free market, mm. you create the black market. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly. what we need to stop in South Africa. Exactly. And, 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 and of course, Ivan, as you say, I mean, this is more than just, you know, about 40,000 people. This is also just about the, the households that they support. In fact, that's why on studio today, um, or joined to, by Zoom, we've got Tinashe Nyamoduga, who's the founder of Kumusha Wines. And he began his business about three years ago, having had extensive experience in the hospitality industry. Tinashe, I wonder bring you in here um, and I want to ask you I mean obviously as a small business uh, what is the impact uh, that this liquor ban has had on your bottom line uh, thank you for having me well it's, it's it's massive you know we were so reliant in selling our wines in, in uh, restaurants uh, hotels and, and retail so that line has completely been shut off uh, and, and for a small emerging business like mine, which was in its third year, uh, the most critical uh, part of the, of the business structure, you know, you, you become hopeless, to be honest, mm. uh, because you, you can't even plan for next month or the, the month after. Mm. So zero revenue uh, and maybe a little lifeline with the export coming through, but it's just, just been terrible. And the thing is, I mean, Ivan mentioned it briefly just now that there is a new harvest coming in. I mean, I don't know much about this, but there's a new harvest coming in. It creates um, some, you know, stress on the on the system because if you've got a new harvest, then obviously you don't have storage if you are not selling wine. Yeah, definitely. So to give you an example, I'm sitting on almost uh, eighty percent of stock, uh, my personal stock at the farm. Uh, compared to last year, which I should have moved already. And now uh, storage facilities are charging even three times the last sure. month. The prices have gone up as well. So if I were to move my wines to an off storage, then bring them back, I'm eating in my margin. So by the time I do that, I'm selling at a loss. Yeah. And obviously, you know, the harvest has to come. Wine yeah. is an agri agricultural project. Uh, most of it, we're gonna throw down uh, on the ground, but we do have to harvest. And where are we going to put all this fruit coming in, you know? Yeah. And, you know, the farm I work with, which is in the Rossenville, uh, yeah. big wine uh, supplier of styles. So now there is even talk of making uh, grape concentrate just to mm. alleviate uh, the, the losses. It's not mm. making money, but, you know, it's just purely cutting costs. So the mm. pressure in the uh, warehouses is just enormous. There is yeah. no way to put the wine. Yeah, sure. Ivan, I mean, you know, I, Tanasha paints a grim picture here. I mean, as a small business owner, I mean, he's looking at losses that are that could bury his business. I mean, what has the Western Cape government been doing? You know, just, you know, some of the quick interventions that you've been doing to try and, and help the situation. Yeah. Well, one of the first interventions, uh, my colleague, the Minister of Finance and Economic Development, Minister David Mania, mm. he has offered some relief packages and relief support specifically 
to our SMMEs. And I think one of the things that we must understand that in the wine industry, mm. there's about 80% of the people that are working in, in the SMME uh, mm. industry. So it is particularly important that we support them. Mm. We also know a significant number. In fact, the majority of the people working in this industry are women. Mm. And so uh, we as the Western Cape government has been supporting them, uh, specific from our provincial allocations That's to incredible. support our, our farmers, in particularly uh, the farmers in the SMME industry, mm. and we need to do much more, but particularly yeah. also in, from the perspective of the tourism sector, and I'm deeply concerned that, again, the national government wants to consider a race-based classification mm. to support mm. people in the tourism industry. Mm. We need to support tourism. Yeah. We have to stop and break out of this racial national politics. Mm. This mm. pandemic affects everybody in mm. South Africa. Mm. And everybody that I speak to, black, white and colored, they just want the government to support them irrespective mm. of their race because mm. they work in an integrated manner. Mm. And so we have been calling on the government to really move away from race-based politics. It is harming the industry. Yeah. And it is a tragedy that this government, government perpetuate racial politics mm. to further divide people during mm. this pandemic. And people want to work. And, mm. and, and ultimately, Dean, I want to bring you in here also um, where we're talking about revenue that's generated by the industry. You know, it can sound very macroeconomical where people are talking about in the billions. But what does it actually mean? Why do we need to care about that? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, every rand that is generated through alcohol taxation goes into the national fiscus, which mm. actually supports health care, uh, uh, harms reduction, education. So for every rand that we're not collecting, we're going to have to find that somewhere else, and we're mm. probably going to have to borrow that at mm. a higher rate uh, uh, than we have done previously, mm. uh, because our credit rating continues to slide. So we just economically cannot afford that on a national macro mm. picture. But it also has real consequences for businesses that employ people. Mm. We see the job loss numbers coming through now from big, big manufacturers. Mm. Uh, it takes a, a little bit longer for the smaller guys to come through. But as I said earlier, 165,000 people have lost their jobs. Whether we like it or not, the alcohol industry is, exp is expensive in South Africa, mm. from restaurants to liquor stores mm. to uh, wine farms. Tourism. Uh, tourism. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of South African culture. Mm. Uh, and, and to take that away, mm. uh, I think, has been truly tragic. Mm. And it's a lot harder to uh, create a job that's been lost than retain a job. Yeah. So for every day that the government sits and uh, twiddles its thumb on this issue, uh, more people are going to join the unemployment queue. Yeah. And it just doesn't make sense that when we have um, 10 million people who are unemployed, why do we not want people to work? Mm. Uh, so it is really tragic. Uh, it, it costs uh, the economy. Um, and uh, and for the as long as it keeps uh, going, mm. uh, we're going to continue to get into a financial hole. Yeah, and ultimately, I think uh, I think to my panel members, this is obviously a very complex issue because you've got to be able to strike a balance, and that's why it was absolutely crucial to be able to build healthcare system capacity so that you may be able to deal with the peak when it eventually uh, came so that you can be able to keep your economy open and safely. And so we're going to be moving on to our next uh, uh, um, discussion, but this is all that we have time for for this discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Now we're moving at looking at uh, the DA at work feature, where we're looking specifically at what the DA is doing to challenge national government with regards to the details of the vaccine plan. Take a look.
Helen, uh, I'm going to come straight to you as the chairperson of Federal Council. Um, this this is obviously something that you are spearheading for for the organisation. What what are we seeking from from national government, and why is this important? Well, I think so. If I could just rewind a little bit to the personal protective equipment mm. and the billions that were raised and mm. then spent on that. And the promises that President Ramaphosa made that there would be no corruption in PPE. Mm. And of course, five minutes later, there were the headlines and the revelations that there had been huge corruption in PPE and various connected politicians and their family members and other networks of the ANC enriching themselves massively as middlemen because they weren't producing the sanitizers, mm. they weren't making the masks, they were just getting up the BBBEE points of the people who were actually doing it, mm. and as middlemen raking in literally hundreds of millions mm. for the right colour and the right connections. Mm. And that was massively disillusioning to South Africa, mm. that a crisis like this, and where people had donated so much of their personal funds, mm. many of us did, I know the DA did, many mm. of us did personally as mm. well, suddenly to find that people were cynically using a crisis to enrich themselves. Mm. So we have lost all faith mm. in the ANC to be able to manage any kind of procurement at all, let alone a rollout. And now billions are going to be spent on a vaccine yeah. that we only ordered just the other day, by the mm. way. Mm. And Cyril Ramaphosa wants a get out of jail free card by blaming the West for having ordered in time. Mm. We didn't order in time. And now we're blaming everybody else no. because we didn't get our act together. Mm. And that's always easy to do that. So we're saying we want transparency. Now, mm. the TAC, the Treatment Action Campaign, in the HIV crisis, yeah. originally when they were trying to get treatment, they got full transparency. I think it was from a constitutional court judgment yeah. mm. that said South Africans have a right to know who we are procuring from mm. and how we are rolling it out mm. and who's benefiting mm. from that process. Mm. And so we're asking exactly the same thing. Mm. And we're asking the court to give an order to make sure that Cyril Ramaphosa answers the questions that our leader, John Steenhuisen, has put to him, mm. to which we've had no answers yeah. yet. Mm. And I mean, so you mentioned the TAC case. And I mean, at the time, the court gave the Department of Health essentially an order which said, you know, here are the timelines, this is what you need, and you need to constantly report back, which is essentially what we are wanting from government. Because some people will, would argue and say, Helen, well, why don't you just let government do what it says it's going to do? Why are you on their case about, you know, <laughs> asking these details? Well, if people haven't learned by now that what the government says and what it does are two entirely different things, mm. they've been living in another country mm. or under a rock. Mm. Because even with this crisis, we've had all kinds of promises from just give us three weeks to fix the healthcare system mm. and to prepare it. Just enable us to do this. Promise you there won't be any corruption mm. with that. Mm. And one after the other, the promises are broken. Yeah. yeah. One after the other. Yeah. Our job as the official opposition yes. is to make sure that promises are kept. Yeah. And the only way we ensure that promises are kept is to get the information. Mm. That's why our leader, John, went on television and spoke directly to the president and said, these are the questions yeah. to which we need answers. Yeah. Yeah. Please give us your answers within seven days. Yeah. We don't like going to court. Mm. We don't like fighting. Of course. But we have to stand up for the people of South Africa. Mm. So give us the answers and things will be fine. Yeah. Of course, you've had nothing, yeah. and now we have to go to court. And ultimately, I mean, the questions that we are asking, they, they aren't, you know, they, they aren't impossible questions to answer if you've got a plan. We want to understand where we're procuring the vaccines. Do we have a sustainable source of the vaccines? How much are we spending on uh, on vaccines? What are, who are your manufacturers? How are the you the middlemen? Mm. Yeah, and how are you going to roll out the vaccine? And as you say, I mean, as the official opposition, ultimately it's our responsibility. Dean, I mean, as mm. members of parliament, we can't actually hold government to account if we don't have anything that we can hold, you know, that we can look against mm. and, and a list that we can say, you these are the timelines, you didn't meet them. Absolutely. I mean, it's the cornerstone of any functional democracy. Mm. Uh, that is our job as the official opposition. It's what we expect of the opposition where we're in government yeah. 
to do. Uh, and it's absolutely important that we do so, and we'd be failing in our constitutional duties if we didn't do so. The fact that the president cannot answer these mm. simple questions within mm. seven days, I mean, that's more than enough time. You would expect him and his ministers to have this information on hand, mm. but he cannot do so, mm. actually raises some serious red flags mm. and, and should cause South Africans to be very, very concerned. Mm. Ivan, I mean, somebody at home might say, why is this information important to me? I mean, why must I know when the vaccine is arriving? And, and you know, why is the DA making a big fuss out of this? Well, we know that information is power. Mm. And the more information you have, the more power you have. Mm. And as Yalan Zala correctly pointed out, in the first phase of uh, COVID-19, we have seen massive corruption. So we mm. can adequately predict that there will be some massive corruption. Mm. And when you put the Deputy President Didi Mabuza in yeah. charge of this particular campaign. Yeah. He's responsible to oversee ESCOM and yeah. we know that the country is in the dark. So yeah. we need to ask these Absolutely. questions because we're the official opposition in South Africa with the big, biggest political party mm. outside the governing party and therefore we have a right to ask these questions to inform the citizens because what we don't get from the public broadcasting uh, Corporation, the SABC, we don't we don't get the real news, mm. and therefore the Democratic Alliance will go to court to find these right answers because our leader, as the uh, of leader of the official opposition, needs to be able to engage with the president mm. to get some clarity and answers. Public accountability is one of the pillars of the yeah, Democratic Alliance. Absolutely, and I mean ultimately, you you hit the nail on the head, Ivan. To put the deputy president, who's basically been socially distancing for the past 10 months, um, in responsible for the task team that is going to look at ensuring that we roll out this vaccine should be a concern for all of us. I mean, uh, Didi Mabuza has failed. I think we, he's a professional distancer, not a, a social absolutely, distancer. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Dean, quickly, yeah. I want to bring you in on you came in this week uh, with the regards to the BE requirement. The president made comments that, you know, BE is going to be a criteria with regards to the suppliers or the deliverers of, of the vaccine. Your view and what you've been saying this week? Yeah, I mean, the president uh, outrageously came out and said that he's going to look to create BE opportunities in the rollout of the vaccine. Mm. Now, quite frankly, you know, if the president is looking to monetize a pandemic where people are losing their lives and livelihoods, that really calls into question his morals and ethics. Mm. And I think it's grossly grotesque and sickening that he would look to try and grease the wheels within his own political party to buy favour amongst the middlemen that Helen uh, spoke about earlier uh, on the backs of people's lives. Mm. What we need is we need a vaccine that comes out quickly and cost effectively mm. without the middlemen. We know that BE has been nothing other than a, a front for corruption over the last 27 years. It's been used to buy favour within the, within the ANC. Uh, the, uh, those details are coming out within the Zondo Commission. Uh, we've seen that within PPE uh, procurement. And when people are dying in their hundreds every single day, mm. this is not a moment to mm. start applying uh, uh, race-based uh, criteria to vaccine rollouts. We mm. want it today, we want it cheaply and quickly, and we don't want corruption involved. Yeah, and ultimately, I mean, if there are opportunities for small businesses to get involved in this process, we want all small businesses to get involved in this process so that we can ensure that people are afforded um, opportunity to work. Well, and ones that actually have a specialization yeah. in yeah. this sort of thing. Yeah. Not someone who has a car wash yeah, who yeah. now starts operating a vaccine rollout uh, operation. I mean, the SANDF couldn't even close the refrigerator door yeah. and we lost 40% uh, uh, of, of, of medical yeah, there. Yeah. So, you know, if they can't be trusted uh, to do something effectively, you know, we really need to look at this uh, it, it, with, a, with a close eye. Yeah. Uh, that's why uh, we've, we're putting these questions uh, to the president. We're now going to have to go to court to, uh, to do so, but we're going to keep a very close eye on it. And the president actually should take that statement uh, back, walk it back, uh, and apologize to South Africans for looking mm. to buy political favor uh, at the expense of people's lives yeah, and livelihoods. Yeah. So we've got a special feature this week. We are joined uh, last week when we had this conversation about the vaccine. There were people who expressed concerns about the safety of the vaccine. 
can it be trusted can they take it and so what we've decided we've actually invited uh christian for uh, who's a content producer and a music director in johannesburg who was one of the 2000 volunteers in south africa who took the vaccine for the AstraZeneca clinical trial uh christian hello thank you so much for joining us good morning nice to be here so first up, I mean, you've had the vaccine and uh, when did you receive it? Just explain to us very quickly the process. Well, I was um, notified of the trial in July last year. So I applied. You have to go through a very stringent medical examination. Um, after qualifying for it, I received the first vaccine in August and 28 days later, the second one. So the study works where half of the respondents get a placebo and half get the real thing. I did go with a couple of my friends and I can tell you, I did get the symptoms. They are very meticulous around how you diarize your symptoms. And um, I did feel groggy for a couple of days, but um, yeah, that was the thing. It's been a very interesting ride so far. Yeah. And I mean, Christian, uh, I mean, there are many voices expressing concern, I think. And before, you know, before we make, we, we poke fun at people who are worried about 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 the, their health. I mean, generally, people are scared. People, people are scared and they're anxious and they want to know, can I trust this? Can I trust this to save my life? I mean, and what would you say to somebody who says, I'm reticent to take a vaccine? I'm not going to lie, Siv. I was I was scared, um, and when we arrived at the Bramfontein Witt Center, it's right above the Hillbrow Morgue, so there were hearses outside. I was skeptical, <laughs> uh, but being a creative, I said, "Let's go for it." This is yeah. part of being. It's almost like watching the Berlin Wall fall. Yeah. Um, you part of mm. yeah. Um, I I know, even though some people are fighting for the alcohol ban, there are also people trying to ban the vaccines. Mm. My, my reasoning is, why don't you then take away your polio, your tuberculosis, mm. your smallpox, all of those. Mm. Um, if we didn't get those vaccines years back, a lot of us would not be alive today. Absolutely. That is why I'm so concerned about the fight around the vaccine and whether that is safe, opposed to the government not doing their job. I mean, mm. the, the bailout for SAA can mm. immunize entire South Africa. Yeah. The yeah. entire South Africa yeah, right. with yeah. AstraZeneca, with both shots. Yeah. But yeah. now we're fighting about whether we should have the vaccine. Yeah. I I was on a national. I was in an article on a national in a national Afrikaans newspaper. I was ostracized. I went mm. onto a big radio station with a friend of mine, Rian. The same happened. Um, mm. I'm gobsmacked. Yeah. People think that I'm lying on a drip next to Sigourney Weaver in Palandaba. Mm. It's not the case. Yeah. It's a yeah. vaccine. It's like getting the flu injection. Yeah. You don't get side effects. Exactly. You get symptoms. Exactly. Small symptoms. Exactly. And, and of course, that is and of course, Christian, I mean, the, if you look at the trade-off, right, you know, of getting this vaccine versus, you know, the getting COVID, the, the getting COVID mm. and, and, and the impact of that and the possible death, then obviously, I mean, the choice, the, the choice then is quite simple. Well, there's a study going on in America at the moment uh, around people who have had very serious cases of COVID. Mm. And one in four seems to... <laughs> leave the hospital bed with a serious mental illness, whether it be depression or whatever. Mm, the mm. Work on the, you slice off years of your life if you get mm, COVID mm, in a bad way. Mm, mm, that's your mm, So mm. I, I, I just think the people who are complaining that the beaches were closed over December <laughs> are most likely people that will complain about the vaccine. Mm. We need Take it. This I've lost seven people mm. in the past ten days mm. from COVID, sure. and sure. it is generations that are suffering. Yeah. The, yeah. Infant, the older people, the younger people, mm. my age, forty-five. Um, it, it's a serious thing. Yeah. I 
Uh, it looks as if I'm making a joke of it. No, but you're not. I, you're not. Yes, I, I have had the vaccine. I was one of the first people in South Africa. Whether I had the placebo or not, mm. I was on the trial. Mm. I will get the real thing. Yeah. My question is, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to break the economy mm. or build their bank account? Yeah. Absolutely. And as, look, and as we mentioned last week, um, you know, that we understand the anxiety around people taking a vaccine. But we also know that there's been 60 million um, vaccine doses which have been administered across the world. And our view is that this vaccine is our only shot at getting some kind of normality back in South Africa. And so really, it's not just about uh, saving me. It's not just about, it's also about protecting my loved ones. It's also about protecting my community. And so I really do urge South Africans when the, the, the vaccine is available to us, that we, we take it and uh, we are diligent about it, but we still continue also practicing all the non-pharmaceutical um, uh, interventions of social distancing and, take, and, and putting on a mask. Um, Helen, I know you want to talk to, um, to South Africans about some of the work that we are trying to do um, as the official opposition in trying to get greater transparency around this vaccine rollout plan. Indeed, so that's exactly what we do want to do because we in the Democratic Alliance work every day to fulfill the constitutional promise mm. that South Africa will be a democracy, will have accountability, will have the rule of law. Mm. And that makes a massive difference to every single person in their daily lives. Mm. So we have asked all the questions that need to be asked. The president isn't answering us. And now for South Africa, we have to get those answers through a court order. Mm. That costs us a lot of money. Mm. And so I'm saying to South Africans, if you can spare anything to contribute to our crucial court case to ensure that there isn't any corruption, that we roll out these vaccines, get it to as many people who really need it as possible, starting with our wonderful frontline healthcare workers yeah. and our teachers and all the people who really deserve to get it without corruption, yeah. so that we can maximize health, and get back to normality as soon as possible. Yeah. Please go to our website, click on donate, and whatever amount it is, is really going to help us to fight this battle on your behalf. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, it's been such an incredibly um, a fruitful discussion. And I want to thank Christian uh, for sharing your story with us. It has been really inspiring. It's great to also see somebody who can say that I've taken it. I've been part of a trial. I did it. Um, and so can you. And also, I want to thank um, uh, Tanasha as well, who's telling us his story uh, about uh, about 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 his his business and how that has been trying to survive during this time. Uh, and thank you, Helen, and thank you, Ivan, and thank you, Dean, for joining me um, on the inside track and for dealing with some of these complex issues. As we know that there are no simple answers, but we'll be back after this. Africa. We will continue to keep you informed as the nation grapples with arguably the biggest test in democratic history. We are also excited to launch a new platform to keep you informed on our weekly Inside Track WhatsApp Bulletin. 
Just WhatsApp hi to 063-181-0059 and we'll sign you up to receive our weekly bulletins on a Monday to get to the heart of news and politics in South Africa. Until then, keep it tight, Mzanti.